Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Amanda, and I'm coming to you live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And for the next half hour, we are going to be discovering and learning more about animals and their adaptations. So if you would like to participate along with us and you have any questions or observations that you would like to share during this class, we invite you to text us at the number that you're going to see on the screen. Now, children, make sure that you do have your parents' permission before you text, uh, because as much as we would love to hear from you, um, regular text messaging rates may apply, and so you need to make sure you have permission. But the number is right here, 562-286-1838. Uh, but we would love to hear from you and have you join along with us. So let's go ahead and get started by talking about what an adaptation is. So an adaptation is something that an animal has, either a physical or a behavioral characteristic of it that helps it to survive in its environment or in its habitat where it lives. So we have some beautiful animals right around me, right behind me here. Um, and the person putting up this beautiful selection of scenery behind me is my friend Stacy in the studio. I also have my friend Alicia, who is ready to answer any of your text questions as they come on in and to relay them to me so that I can answer them for you live during this program. Now, if you're watching this program after we've already aired and it's no longer live, you are welcome to still contact us with any questions you might have at our email, which is live at lbaop.org. So again, that's live at LB for Long Beach, AOP, Aquarium of Pacific, dot org. And we have staff who will be happy to answer those email questions, um, even if it's not during our program. So we would love to hear from you um, either now or later. All right, so adaptations. How do animals use them to help them survive? Well, the first animal I want us to kind of focus in our attention on, actually, before we get to that, um, I want you to think about yourself because all animals have adaptations that help them survive, including people. So what adaptations do you have? Like, what are some things that you have that help you to, say, breathe? Hmm. Well, there's a few different things that we use to help us breathe. First of all, if you think about the outside of your body, we have our nose, right? We breathe through our nose. Our nose. We can also breathe through our mouth. And then where does that go when we breathe? It goes inside and down to our lungs. So our lungs are an important adaptation that help us to breathe. Well, what about how we move? Getting around is important for us to be able to survive. What kinds of adaptations do we have to help us move? Well, if you just look at yourself, you look at your body, you've got long legs, we've got bones inside of us to give us some structure, and we've also got feet on the end of those legs. We've got muscles inside that are helping to move and coordinate that. Of course, coordinating all of this together is our brain inside of our head. So adaptations that help us to move. The way I move and you move is very different than how this animal behind us is moving. Now also think about how you eat. That's another important thing to help you survive. What adaptations do you have that help you to eat? Well, of course we have our mouths, but what is special about our mouths? What do we have inside of them to help us eat? Well, you can mention it to a friend if you're in a room with somebody else or your mom or brother or sister. Um, you can shout out to the screen if you'd like. And again, you can always text us in. But what adaptations do you have? We have teeth inside of our mouth. We have our tongue with taste buds that help us to taste our food. And even our saliva is helping to break down the food before we even swallow it. So those types of adaptations. And then once it goes into our body, it goes to our stomach, helps us digest our food. And of course, you know where the waste comes out. All right, well, we've, we've talked about how we breathe, how we move, how we eat. Let's go ahead. All of these things together are helping us survive, but there's also something else that helps us to protect ourselves. So what do we have on our body that protects us? What is our first layer all over us that's protecting us? Well, we've got skin and our skin protects us. Our hair, our eyelashes protect us. So now I want you to kind of switch your thinking to the animals that live in the ocean. And I would like to introduce you to an animal and have you make some observations about the adaptations it has that helps it to survive in the ways that we've talked about. So I'm going to have my friend Stacy bring up a picture of a ray. Now, when you look at this stingray, what adaptations do you notice? What do you see that is helping this animal to protect itself and help it survive? How does it eat? How does it move? And how does it breathe? 
Is there anything that you can see on this picture that would let you know? Well, again, you're welcome to text in, but I'm noticing just one thing we didn't really talk about a whole lot is its shape. Look at the shape of this animal. Do you think having that flat shape helps it to survive? Think about the habitat that it's living in. So this is what we call depressed body shape. So fish have different types of shapes. And this one is what we call depressed because it's flattened out. It's flattened out like a pancake from top to bottom. Now looking at this environment, why do you think that its shape might help it to survive? Can you think of any reason? Well, what else do you see in this picture? Well, I also see some other animals. Here's a shovel nose guitar fish that also looks kind of depressed. It has a flat shape as well. And what part of the water do you see them in? Are they swimming up at the top or are they swimming at the bottom? At the bottom, and what type of habitat is at the bottom of the ocean here? Yeah, it's sand. So that flat shape is going to help it survive in this habitat with some sand. Well, also, as you're making your observations and looking for more adaptations, I also wanted to say hello to Mrs. Ruiz's fourth grade class from Lassen Elementary. So hello to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you participate along with us as we talk about animal adaptations. Now, Oliver had a question about a cousin of this animal. So Oliver wants to know, because remember, we were talking about how we eat, and then of course, at the waste has to get out of our body. Oliver wants to know, do sharks poo? Yes, they do. And if you think about their mouth is right here and they're similar to us that they eat through their mouth and then it travels long ways through their body and then it comes out right about here. They have an opening where their poo comes out and they have one way that you can help find where it is on a shark is to look for this fin right back here. So this is called an anal fin. And that anal fin will also help them to get rid of any waste um, off their body that's coming out from this area. So you can look for that on fish. That little tiny fin that they have at the bottom of their body helps them get the poo out. So that's where sharks get their poo out. So <laughs> let's go ahead and talk about our flattened out cousin friend, um, the stingray. So what do you notice? What, what sorts of observations do you make? Hmm. Well, the flat body. I also notice that it's darker on the top and lighter on the bottom, and that helps with counter shading. And that's a way of helping it kind of camouflage and blend into its habitat, which also is an adaptation. Now, do you notice anything interesting about its body? How does this animal see? Where are its eyes located? And do you notice anything behind its eyes? Yeah, so here's one eye here. Here's the other eye right here. But look right behind the eye. Do you see that big opening? Do you have any idea what that opening might be for? Well, think about the openings that we have on our body. And one of the things we mentioned, well, we know that we eat, but I don't think that's its mouth. That's not where the mouth is, right? So no food is going in through here. But what other things, what other openings do we have? Ah, when we're breathing, it's going in through our nose. When rays are breathing, where do they breathe from? Well, one of the things that they can use is this right here called a spiracle. So this little opening is what the ray will use to help it to breathe. Now there's also another view we can take looking at the stingray to see where else it has that helps it breathe. Do you notice down here, those little slots right there? Well, those are the gill slits. And so fish have something very different than you and I have to help them breathe. They don't breathe oxygen in the air like us with lungs. Instead, they're breathing the water and that water is going into a special part of their body that pulls oxygen from the water. Do you know what part that is? the gills. So just like any other fish that swims in the ocean, um, stingrays also have gills. So here are the gills on the underside. But remember how we saw that picture of it sitting on the bottom? If the gills are on the bottom of the stingray's body, how is it going to be able to breathe? Well, that could be very difficult, right? Well, that's when the spiracles come in because the spiracles allow the ray to breathe the water even if its gills are covered in the sand. So it can bring the water in through the top and they can still breathe. 
It's kind of like you and I, if we were to go snorkeling, and we don't want to keep on coming up and breathe and raising our head out of the water every time we need to take a breath, and we want to just keep looking at the wonderful world of the ocean below us, if we just have that little snorkel, we can keep looking down but still be breathing the air from the top. So that's kind of like how the stingray can breathe using its spiracles. So it uses spiracles. That's a great adaptation. And what other adaptations do you notice about this animal? What does it use to help it move? We mentioned that we have feet and legs. What does the stingray have? All right, well, as you know, fish have fins, but where are the fins on the stingray? Did you realize that these two long parts that look like wings are actually fins? Yeah, those are what are called the pectoral fins of the stingray. So it uses its pectoral fins, like wings, to help it glide through the ocean. And it doesn't use its tail in the same way. However, it does have a very important adaptation on its tail. Do you know what it is? Hmm, I'm gonna let you think about it for a minute. Think about the name. Well, as you think, we're gonna look at some other animals that live in the coral reef. And here, let's see, do you see any stingrays in here? Because this is one of the habitats they live in. I see one of their cousins. I see the uh, zebra shark right down here. I see a, a bonnet head shark right up here. But keep your eyes open. This one that I see isn't actually moving. Do you see a stingray that's staying very still? This would be a really good eye spy game. This is a stingray that likes to, remember we said they're flat, so it's gonna be kind of flattened out. But do you see it? It's right near the middle of your screen, right below that big fish that just swam through the middle, right here. So that right there is a southern stingray, and it's just hanging out, sitting on the coral reef here in our uh, coral reef habitat at the um, Aquarium of the Pacific here. Oh, here's another one. This is an eagle ray. Look at it. Look at those beautiful fins, those pectoral fins, and the long tail. But what else is on the tail? Now, I know some of you have some questions about jellies, and we're going to talk about them in just a little bit. But right now, Think again about other adaptations that the stingray has. We said that they can breathe with their gills and they breathe with their spiracles. We said, oh, they have eyes on top of their head. They can move with their, with their fins, but how do they protect themselves and how do they eat? That's a good question. Where are, where is the mouth of these animals? And what do you think the inside of its mouth would look like? Well, maybe we can bring up a closer picture of the underside again. Do you see that area right there? That's the mouth of the stingray. Now its eyes are up on the top. I know sometimes it looks like these are two cute little eyes and a big smiley face. It does look like a smiley face. Uh, but these right here, this is the mouth and their eyes are on top. So they can't really see what it is that they're eating. If their eyes are up here and their mouth is way down here, they can't see, well, how can they find their food? Well, stingrays and sharks have something very special that help direct them to their food called ampullae of Lorenzini. And these are basically little electroreceptors right at the base of like their snout sort of area. So right around their mouth. And it's one of the ways that they can sense that food is in maybe buried in the sand where they can't even see it or smell it or hear it. And obviously not taste it or touch it. But if they swim really close to it, they can pick up on the electrical pulses coming from the animal as it's moving. Every time your heart beats, it gives off an electrical impulse that the stingray actually would be able to sense if he was really, 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 really close to you. But this animal can just swim over the top of its food even without seeing it and be able to eat it. So they eat things living on the bottom of the ocean like snails and crabs, maybe even worms, things like that. And then they crunch it open with their hard teeth. So I actually have an example of some stingray teeth right here. They actually have really flat teeth that are great for grinding and crushing hard shelled things. So this doesn't look like the type of teeth you would expect to see from uh, many animals mouths, does it? It doesn't even look like teeth. I know sometimes people say it looks like uh, snake skin and the design of those teeth does kind of grow in the pattern like snake skin might look, but these are all individual teeth. So some are long and skinny and some on the ends are a little bit smaller, but they grow together to create a flat grinding and crushing surface. So that's what the mouth of this bat ray, this type of stingray right here. Now, why is this animal called a stingray? What does it do to protect itself? That's right, it has a stinger. But do you know where the stinger is? 
Now, it's kind of hard to see, but right here, there's a little tiny fin. So right here is what we call the dorsal fin of this stingray. Not all stingrays have these, but right behind it, right here, is where you would find the spine or the stinger of a stingray. And I actually have some that I can show you. So here you can see an example. So those, there's a little dorsal fin, and right behind here is where the stinger would be. So it lies flat across the top of the stingray's tail. Did you think it was at the tip of the tail? It's not. Now, it can vary from species to species. So different types of rays will have their stingers at different places along their tail. Some are closer to the base of the tail, like the bat ray. Some might be, you know, about midway back. And some rays have more than one stinger. They might have two stingers um, on, or what we would call a spine, on their tail. But would you like to see what a close-up view of one looks like? We actually have some here that I'm going to use my document camera uh, to show you. So here are an example of three stingers. Um, I believe these are all from round rays. But if you look carefully, you'll see, we'll zoom in a little bit, get a closer view that these stingers, or what we call a spine, have these little tiny barbs. So, and yeah, just to give you an idea, this is my hand, it's really big. So these are pretty small stingers. Um, but they have these little tiny barbs right here that can make it very uncomfortable. Um, there's a groove that goes right down the middle of the stinger, of the spine here, do you see it? And that is where the venom would go. So what is venom? Well, venom is what can make this a very unpleasant experience if you were to step on a stingray. We always say that if you're in the water where there's a stingray, you should shuffle your feet, or where there might be stingrays, shuffle your feet in the sand, because then the ray will be able to sense you coming. And believe me, they don't want to be stepped on. They only use their stinger for self-defense, and then they can move out of the way so you don't get stung and they don't get stepped on. But if you were to just pick up your feet and walk like this and step down on a stingray, all they would have to do is whip up their tail and it would cause that spine that's laying across the top of their tail to stick up and it could pierce you and make a very unpleasant sensation in your foot or your leg. And this little groove, or I'm sorry, this little groove right here is where um, some of that venom would be traveling. So what happens is there's a little layer of skin that grows over the outside edge of this spine. So if you look at um, a stingray, you're not going to see necessarily a white thing sticking out all the time. Sometimes it might be kind of covered with some other um, darker coloring like the skin, but inside that little layer between the outside of the skin and between the spine here is where there's venom. And as soon as this pointy part pokes into something, well, it's going to cut through that, that outer covering and cause that venom to make a very unpleasant feeling in the sting wherever they punctured um, their predator or whatever was trying to attack them or accidentally step on them. Okay. So we have a few more questions coming in, but I love that we got to take a closer view of the stingray's stinger or the spine of a stingray. Had you ever seen that before? And did you know that they weren't on the tip of the tail? I thought it was very interesting when I learned that. I used to think it was always the tip, but it's not. Okay, so those are the stingers of our stingray. Now let's go ahead and think about another animal in the ocean. Can you think of another animal in the ocean that can use a sting to protect itself? So the stingray uses a stinger. Can you think of any other animals that have stings to protect themselves? I know a lot of you are texting in questions about the type of animal I'm thinking about right now. And I know that Connor would like to know more about jellyfish adaptations. Is that the animal that you all were thinking of too? So sea jellies are a perfect example of an animal with an adaptation to sting. But what part of the jelly is it that it uses to sting? Well, let's also look at how it's able to move. That's another interesting adaptation. Now, they don't have bones in their body, so they have to get around a little bit differently. They don't have feet. Do you see any feet on them? No. This round part that you see right here is what's called the bell of the jelly. So it's like a big, round, circular bell. And it's kind of the way it moves is it brings water in and out. And it makes that bell go up and down to help it move through the ocean, move through the water. Sometimes they're kind of still, like this one's just kind of floating, not doing other, not doing a whole lot, whereas this one's very active. It's taking that bell and going up and down and up and down. So it has a different way of moving. It's using 
the bell and pushing water to help it to move. Now, what part is actually the stinging part? Well, that can be kind of confusing, so let's point it out. I want you to look at the outside edge of the bell of a jelly. So the round part that's right here. So right here, let's look, try to look at this one who's going sideways. Do you see those long stringy things? They look like, or even on this one right here, they look kind of like long eyelashes. Well, those are the tentacles of the sea jelly, and the tentacles are where the stinging cells are. Now, you might often look at a jelly and see all the stuff hanging down from the middle of it. And you may have thought that those are the tentacles. So here's a great picture to show you the difference. The tentacles, remember, we said were on the outside edge. So these right here are the stinging tentacles of the sea jelly. Long, and they're very dark in color. So this is a different species um, than the, the one we were just looking at. The ones we were looking at earlier were the moon jellies. And then all this frilly stuff right here in the middle, all this white stuff, those are what are called the oral arms. And oral means mouth, and you know what arms are. And so this is what they can use to bring their food from the tentacles where they've stung it, and then bring it on up to where their mouth area would be. Well, where do you see a mouth? Does it look like they have lips or a regular mouth that opens and closes or any teeth that you saw? No, their way of eating is a little bit different. They just have an opening on the underside of their bell that leads into an area that's kind of like a big stomach. So they actually have a few different compartments in their stomachs. They have more than one stomach. They actually have, depending on the type of sea jelly, some of them have four. Some of them have less, and sometimes they even have more. Do you see what might be the four stomachs on this sea jelly? Let's look at it float. I'll move out of the way. I can see the long oral arms in the middle. Oh, did you see that? Do you see those four shapes in the middle? Those are the four stomachs of the sea jelly. So that's where their food is going once they grab it with their stinging cells. Now the stingers, the stinging cells called nematocysts on sea jellies are a little bit different than the stingers on a stingray. So a stingray has one or maybe two stingers that are physical things that point out like that. But these have different types of stingers. In fact, they have lots of them. They have a lot more than just two. They can have hundreds and hundreds of stinging cells on one little tentacle. And so what happens is when something brushes up against them, like maybe a little piece of plankton, if it touches one of their tentacles and the stinging cells, the stinging cells will shoot off this little tiny, like a little arrow or a little harpoon inside of it to help it to grab its food and hang on to it. And then it can use its oral arms to bring it up to the middle. So instead of having just one or two stingers like a stingray does, this one has a lot of them. And they're very sensitive, and they can actually shoot those stinging cells into their food and into the thing uh, that they want to grab or be protected from. So here's a different type of sea jelly. These are sea nettles that you can see the long, colorful tentacles here. And then again, those white oral arms on the inside. So we've looked at how they move. We've looked at how they sting their things or sting um, food or whatever else they're try trying to protect themselves from. Um, and then what about when they have to go to the bathroom, where do you think it comes out? It actually kind of comes out the same way that food goes in, kind of that same opening. But then how do they breathe? I don't see a nose and I don't see regular gills. Well, jellies are a little bit different. They actually breathe through their skin. Basically, they just breathe through their tissues. They don't have the same type of skin we do, but their outer covering, oh, here you can see openings inside there, or stomach area is kind of cool. Um, but you can actually, they can actually breathe right through their tissue. So they don't have gills, they don't have lungs, they can breathe just through their tissue. Isn't that amazing? Pretty incredible adaptations. All right, so more questions about jellies. Why don't jellies have brains? Well, they actually don't need them. Somehow this animal has been able to survive without using a brain. So it does still have nerves, so you think about how we move and how our brain is sending signals all throughout our body to help things work the way they should and help us think and to respond and move. But jellies don't have a central command center of a brain. Our brain is what organizes all that and tells our body what to do. They instead just have a very simple, what they call a nerve net. So a, just a network of all these little nerves that are still working and are still causing the animal to be able to move and to be able to eat but it doesn't really have to think about it. 
It just exists and floats along without any brain at all. Pretty amazing. Adrian wants to know how many types of animals live in the kelp forest. Oh, that's a good question. I actually don't even know the number because there are so many different animals that live in a kelp forest. If you're wondering what a kelp forest is, well, here's an example of one of our exhibits here at the aquarium that has kelp in it. So in you, when you have rocky areas with cooler temperatures like we have right here in Southern California, you can create a habitat where kelp can grow. So this right here is the kelp. And kelp is a big giant seaweed. And as it's waving back and forth in the ocean, it's creating a habitat. It's creating its own home in this open ha ocean habitat for these fish. So you might see some fish that are hanging out right inside the blades of the kelp. Um, you might find a bunch of animals that are hanging out down by the holdfast or like where it sticks onto the rocks, like that area. So you might find things like snails and crabs in that area. And then even up here, the kelp forest creates a canopy. Do you see how it's kind of floating across the top of it? That can be another whole area where animals can make their homes. And so this whole entire area is a kelp forest. So there can be fish in there. There can be small little invertebrates, little animals without bones um, living on the bottom of it. And then of course there can be larger animals swimming in it too, like sea lions. And so here's a great picture of some enjoying their natural kelp habitat. Um, in Southern California. I'm assuming this is Southern California. And they are so cute. Look at them moving. Look at all the adaptations. Look at how they're using their flippers to help them move and navigate through the kelp forest. All right, so thanks for that question, Adrian. All right, now we've talked about sea jellies that can sting. We've talked about uh, stingrays that can sting. Um, did you think of any other animals that can sting in the ocean? There's another one. It's pretty similar to a jelly. Uh, and you may have even touched one before because these don't uh, hurt a whole lot when you touch them. And the animals I'm talking about are the sea anemones. So this right here is another type of stinging um, animal that has tentacles. So the tentacles of the sea anemone, do you notice how they actually face up? So instead of hanging down like the tentacles of a sea jelly, their tentacles face up. Now they're not nearly as strong, but once they grab their food, where is the mouth of the sea anemone? What do you think? Yeah, right there in the center. So they grab their food with their tentacles, their adaptations, they bring it down to their mouth, and then they digest it in this big, basically huge stomach cavity. And then when they are ready to go to the bathroom, guess where it comes out? This is a little bit different. It comes right back out through their mouth. So their mouth is also where they go to the bathroom. Aren't you glad you're not a sea anemone? All right, so they have the tentacles, they have the mouth, but how do they move? We didn't really talk about how a sea, sea anemone moves yet. Is it even possible for them to move? Well, maybe we should look at the rest of its body. So here you can see right here, the body of the sea anemone, and it is stuck to a rock right now. So this is called the column of the sea jelly. And down here at the bottom, they have a foot. It's called a pedal disc or a big foot. And they can stick onto that rock and hang on really tight. Usually they don't move around very much except for when they're moving their tentacles. So they'll be letting their tentacles flow through the water and using them to grab any food that might come their way because they don't have any eyes. That's one adaptation they don't have. They can't look for their food. They just have to feel for it with their tentacles as the water is going back and forth. But if they find that they're in a location and there's not a whole lot of food that's floating by them, they can actually pop their foot right off that rock and they can move somewhere else if they wanted to. They don't move very fast, uh, but they can move. They can slide along. So here's a sea anemone. Here's another one. You can see this sea anemone is holding onto the rock right there. Uh, so interesting animals with some interesting adaptations. All right. I'm thinking of another animal that has a different way of protecting itself besides a stinger. Now, this animal uses instead a hard shell to protect itself. Can you think of any animals in the ocean that have a hard shell? Now, I'm not talking about a sea turtle. That might have been one that you were thinking of, but it does also use a shell to protect itself. I'm thinking about an animal that you may not have given much thought of or much thought to before. It's an animal that you probably have seen in a few different locations. They can be found um, even on land. Uh, they can be found at the beach. In fact, you've probably seen um, dozens of different um, 
of these animals their empty shells on the beach before. Um, but there's lots of different kinds of these. And I'm going to show you an example in my hand of some different animals that use shells. So this one right here, this is a scallop. It looks kind of like a clam. This one right here is called a cowrie. Now, what is a cowrie? Do you have any idea? It does have a hard shell to protect itself. But what's different is that this animal, the scallop, has two shells that it uses to open up like this. The animal I'm thinking of has just one shell and it has that hard outer covering and it uses a foot to glide along. So what kind of animal scoots along on its stomach and has a hard shell? I'll even show you another example of a type of animal that can do this. Here's a shell, a little tiny one. It has a little hole on top and it kind of glides along. This one's called a limpet. And then this is another type. It glides along this way. These are all different types of snails. Now, the particular snail that I'm thinking of also lives in a kelp forest habitat like you see right here. This is a view of our amber forest habitat here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. And at one point, we actually had some of these animals in here. And it's a really exciting story as to why. So I'm going to show you right here. This is my shell of the animal I'm talking about. Oh, and we have a picture right behind me. So this is the inside of their shell. Beautiful. But look at this animal on the outside. You might even not be sure what you're looking at. But this is an abalone. And this is an abalone. This is an abalone. This is an abalone. This and this. And there's probably even some more. That one back. Is that one back there? I can't even tell. And one right here. Well, abalones are a special type of snail that can be found in kelp forests, and they have some interesting adaptations as well. If you were to look at their shell, they just have one part because they live underneath it. And then what do you see around the outside of the shell? It is very hard to see. Um, it can be hard to find an abalone in its habitat that it's looking um, easy to spot all the differences. But do you see how they have this sort of coating that's kind of sticking out. So this outer covering right here, this outer sort of line that you see, is actually the foot of the abalone that it's sliding along. And then right above it, they have these little things that stick out. Here's a better picture of the white abalone right here. They're called tentacles. They have sensory tentacles that stick out around the outside edge of them so that they can kind of see and feel um, what's around them. But they actually do have two special antenna right attached to their head, which you can't really see in any of these photos. Um, and they can sense uh, where there's light and they do have a mouth and they use that special mouth to scrape algae off of the rocks. Now these abalone used to be all over the ocean, especially in Southern California. But unfortunately, their numbers went way, way down due to the fact that people were overfishing, which is when you take some more than um, what is possible for that species to reproduce itself or to replace itself. And so there were so many that were taking out the big abalone that there weren't enough abalone in the ocean to help produce more baby abalone. So their numbers started to go down. But then there was also a little parasite in the water um, that was hurting the abalone and causing them to die. There's also a sickness that caused them to die too. And so we here at the Aquarium of the Pacific have been helping to raise white abalone, which is this one right here. Uh, these right here are red abalone. They have a darker edge to them. But the white abalone we've been raising, they're the first marine invertebrate, which is an animal without a backbone, to be put on the endangered species list. But we're excited that now we've been able to raise them here at the aquarium, and we are helping to release them and put them out in the ocean. In fact, we've already put some abalone back out into the ocean in the area where they used to be. And so we're really excited to help them see them grow and get bigger and bigger. And hopefully all the adaptations that they have will be helping them to survive in their habitat home uh, where they are. And our aquarist staff have worked really hard um, with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and um, I know other organizations like Bodega Marine Laboratory um, is one of our partner um, organizations that has been raising these. And they've been looking at areas in the ocean where there's going to be enough food for them to eat, the right habitat, the right protection from predators, that there aren't a lot of predators of abalone in the area, and that they have all the food supply they need so that their populations will do well. So good news for the abalone, um, and we are really excited to be a part of helping them go back out into the Pacific Ocean where they used to be. 
All right, well, we have run past our time, but thank you so much for enjoying for joining me today. Hopefully you enjoyed yourself as we learn more about adaptations in the ocean. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye everyone.